Hey, everybody. Steve Sanborn here. Thanks for joining. I have today my friend and guest, Karen Russo, here in Kansas City, Missouri. Karen and I have worked together for many years on some pretty interesting projects around patient safety, medical kidnapping, all sorts of different things that required some kind of defensive maneuver to help children, elderly, you name it. We've probably done it. Um, sometimes we do these things a little bit behind the scenes, sometimes not. But what I wanted to invite Karen on today about is the incredible, very, very uh, comprehensive work that she has done over the years in the development of what you might call up front an advanced directive, but not just an everyday advanced directive or what you might think of as a living will. This is a comprehensive approach uh, that acts as an inherent protective measure around people, their lives, their loved one's lives, when they find themselves in places that they can no longer communicate, perhaps they're in a coma, whatever their injury or their disease state, whatever has happened to them, they are now past what I would call the risk point, and they are now in danger, or at least could potentially be in danger and require these legal documents uh, to be filed in advance of all this, um, just like an insurance policy would be set up in advance of something happening. This functions as a protective measure. So Karen, if I've said anything in there that needs to be corrected, obviously, correct me, I'm just kind of speaking more as a layman, but I appreciate you joining me. And I wanted to just kind of open up the conversation for a few minutes uh, with kind of maybe why you got into this, how you got into this, and what you see out there in the great wide world where people have failed to take the proper steps to responsibly protect themselves with this kind of documentation that you now refer to as life care interlock as a sort of product or service. So maybe just at, just a few words as to how and why uh, to start it off. The why, um, it, it started with prison health care. And what, what I found out in dealing with health care issues specific to inmates through their family members was that the medical profession contracted by the State Departments of Correction in all states were not paying any attention to what the family members were asking or saying or indicating that they they wanted to be privy to or records that they wanted. There was a shutdown of communication altogether. Granted, it's a government agency. These men and women are in prison. They have no rights. Every possible excuse was given. And over the years, I found out that the one set of rights these inmates continue to have are medical rights. All their other rights are, are gone, but not the medical rights. And if someone wants to argue with me about that, then my pushback question is, if they had no rights, then why would the Department of Corrections or the federal system be putting documents in their face for them to sign off of? whether they're HIPAA authorizations or DNRs or advanced directives in a short form. So I knew right then and there that those medical rights were alive and well. Over the course of 20 some odd years, what I was seeing was those advanced directives were not being adhered to. They were not being incorporated into the individual's multiple files within the system. And the wheels just one by one started falling off the bus. They would be, um, their medical condition would be increasingly more severe to the point of they were dying or they were dead. It was too late, little too little too late. So with that, we started, uh, or I started looking at outside uh, clients that were calling about healthcare issues. Doctors weren't conveying prognosis and diagnosis. They were skirting around the issue. They never answered point blank questions. They didn't return phone calls. Um, nurse practitioners may call them back, but they didn't offer any concrete definitive answers to the questions that these patients were asking. 
that got my attention. Um, then when I would qualify prospective clients, I would say, do you have an advanced directive in place? And they automatically would say, yes, I do. And my next question would always be, where did you get it? And that usually uh, ended up in a conversation about an online form that they pulled off the internet, signed, scanned, had notarized the end. None of them were comprehensive enough. Over the years, I've seen the wiggle room that the medical profession takes when there's not detailed information within an advanced directive that is indicating what a patient wants in healthcare or doesn't want in healthcare. In addition to that, what was glaring to me as a, as a piggyback to that was the agent or healthcare proxy that they would appoint in their medical power of attorney, they did not vet these people very well. You know, they may have been a family member. They may have had a conversation with the family member. You know, the, the family member may have known about their wishes backwards and forwards. But the one thing the family member did not know, and most of them still do not know, is how to fight for the life of that loved one that has named them an agent to their health care. And that has become a real sticky wicket for me. Having the documents in place is one thing, knowing how to use them and fight is a completely different animal. And that's why um, I created the, the life care interlock documents. They're very detailed. Um, people will get confused about an advanced directive versus a living will. And basically, the, both of those documents overlap one to the other. The living will does not allow for an appointment of an agent or a healthcare proxy. The advanced directive does. So it's real important that, that individuals not only have these documents in place, but they need to know specifically what's in them. Just don't sign, get them notarized, and throw them in a file. They need to know the ins and outs of those documents and what this agent can and cannot do. Yeah. Well... You made me think about a lot of things um, in that description. One is kind of just hearkening back onto some of the scenarios that we've been involved in. And I'm not going to call them out by name because neither of us really want uh, to be overly connected to um, some of the approaches we've taken in the past. But I do have a good example of one that would reflect um, the kinds of things that we've been involved in. And that would be the case of Terry Schiavo back in 2005, which of course got a tremendous amount of media coverage because it was sort of a first of its kind, probably not the very first. And I think what happened to Terry Schiavo happens every day of the week in hospitals across the entire country. And so similar types of situations have come our way. And in many of those scenarios, the patients, the families obviously did not have any of this kind of documentation in place, but it can happen. And doctors, medical staff, ethics boards, et cetera, can suddenly be making decisions for people's lives as to whether they live or die. Uh, parents or adult children, friends, neighbors, cousins, whoever, uh, stand by idly, incapable of knowing what to do, how to do it. And so, one of the things that I really have always liked about what you have built is that it's customizable and in, in the sense that, I mean, you know, everybody who knows me knows that, I mean, I have, I have religious beliefs as do you. And some of those religious beliefs have to do with the end of my life and my death. And I want to be able to at least dictate what my religious held beliefs are in order to try to control as best as possible what takes place so that some stranger who just encountered me five minutes ago is not making decisions for me after a lifetime. But this is what's happening to people every day all over the country. Um, and so the idea that an individual, and I keep, I'll keep coming back to this, will take responsibility to analyze and to can you know put deep consideration into what they ought to have planned 
Uh, because any one of us can walk out the door today, tomorrow, and bam, we've hit our head. Now we're in a coma. We're lying in a bed. We don't even know we're there. Some loved one, a spouse, you know, a child, a brother, whatever, shows up totally unprepared for this, is told a lot of things in rapid succession. He doesn't know the, the language. You know, he or she doesn't know the procedures and the processes and you know, all these other things that, that go on. And so, you know, and I'll talk again, and I made another video some time back earlier this year about uh, a woman who is in my care. I'm her medical power of attorney, and I use the documentation that you have developed, which is, it has given me a solid, um, really impenetrable position within the realm of a nursing care uh, facility within the context of hospice care, within the context of emergency hospital visits for procedures, et cetera, I am in charge. Nobody disputes it. But I also come with attitude. I don't just come with this shield that you've built. I also come with you know some experience from the past and some attitude that I will remain in charge. I will not be bowled over. I will not be convinced otherwise, or at least not in a five minute conversation. I will take information and I will go back and I will consider it with the help of people like you or other forms of leadership in my life to make sure that the right decision is being made. And boy, did it come in handy earlier this year when a hospice organization, and I will say a secular uh, business-oriented hospice, not a religious-affiliated hospice, had been involved with care just for a few weeks and suddenly wanted to shut it all down, shut off food, shut off hydration, and without your documents, and, and, and not only the documents, but the impression that those documents have created in those environments. There aren't too many people like me walking into these facilities with this type of solid, irrefutable, uh, legal uh, documentation that basically lets everybody know, don't give me any trouble, do what I tell you to do. And that's how this has gone. So I also just wanted to ask you for high level attributes, because what you've created, when we just say advanced directive, I think the average person would rightly think, oh, that's a document. But you're dealing with more than a single document. And so in, in, in sort of a high level way, can you give a little bit of description of what that means? And again, I don't think you need to get super detailed because I'm not going to I'm not going to pull any punches with viewers. This is work product. This is protected work product. People who want access to these documents have to sign in a non-disclosure agreement because other people out there will undoubtedly either steal it or parts of it or try to replicate little things and probably get patients in more trouble than it's worth. This has been uh, very comprehensively built meticulously over years, uh, according to the rules and regulations of all 50 states of the United States. This is a work product that is deserving of its own protection. And so that is why I'm asking Karen to kind of just give a high level. And then what I intend to do with anyone watching who would then like to learn more I will create some additional shorter videos with Karen and, and we will make those sort of the unlisted private listed uh, links that we can send out uh, for individuals to watch individually. All right. So having said that, high level concept as to what you have built and, and why. The, or is that is that even putting you on the spot? <laughs> no, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out where do I where do I start with that? Um, the life care interlock documents um, are the armored car. Uh, that's the best way I can describe that. It's an armored car. Um, it's just not the advanced directive, but it's the advanced directive coupled with a living will. I've married those two together. And it includes also a medical power of attorney. It includes a um, personalized authorization uh, to disclose 
healthcare information, AKA HIPAA. Um, in certain states, they require a mental directive to be included in an advanced directive. Not all states do that, but some states do, and it becomes very important for individuals to know that that is a requirement, especially if a loved one is um, has early set dementia or Alzheimer's or mental health issues. You have to have that incorporated in there. Every state has their own laws governing advanced directive slash living will slash medical powers of attorney. Um, we deal, I deal with all 50 states. So the, the higher level part of that is an individual has got to know, just absolutely has to know how they interlock, how they interchange one with the other. If, for example, uh, if, if somebody sends in just uh, the advanced directive without the other, well, let's just say they send in all of it. Um, we put it in a packet, everything is proprietary, everything is patient oriented, a, a, a non-disclosure thing is sent to the patient initially so they understand, do not copy, do not, you know, do not share, blah, blah, blah. Um, once they have that in their possession, um, we want them to share it, not just with everybody on the planet. You, you need to share it with, you know, their, their primary care physicians, surgeons, hospitals, clinics that you're involved in. Anything outside of that is not necessary. Um, one of the, one, I'll, let me just give you a couple of things that just pop into my head. Um, the first question I always get is, don't I have to have a lawyer to create these documents? And the answer to that is no. Do I have to let me get more detail? Do I have to have a lawyer to create an advanced directive? The answer is no. Do I have to have a lawyer to create a living will? The answer is no. Do I have to have a lawyer to create a medical power of attorney? No. You don't have to have a lawyer for any of these things. What I've learned is there are there are um what am I trying to say? They're like sub chapters within a chapter of an advanced directive that that are put into this advanced directive that I've seen actually happen in real life. For example, if if there's a patient client that is is mentally fine, they don't have dementia, they don't have Alzheimer's, they're not in a coma, but they're in there for some medical issue, and they are on painkillers. Uh, morphine, any kind of a drug uh, that's going to alter their mental faculties. Yep. Well, the straight line advanced directive medical power attorney actually legally doesn't go into effect until you're unable to speak for yourself. Well, there's a there's a loophole there. There's a gap because if you're under the influence of high, you know, high dosages of painkillers, whatever it may be. And somebody walks in and says, well, you, don't, you know, do you, would you like a DNR in, in place? Would you like this in place? And they start throwing questions out at the patient. That patient isn't isn't in a state mentally to answer anything. And I wanted the wiggle room out of that. And so these this advanced directive is very specific to very specific situations that arise that I've been privy to in the last 30 years. And so I wanted those nailed down. And in yep. effect, I basically say, don't even think about leaning over the side of my bed and asking me to blink my eyes twice if I want a DNR or squeeze my hand if I right. want a DNR and somebody's got Parkinson's. So, you know, I can give examples all day long. So the high level is unpacking that advanced directive as it unfolds for the loved one. You can have somebody in a hospital bed for one uh, medical condition and then something else pops up. Um, I had one client, he was a veteran, just nothing wrong with him. He was in a rehab center in a nursing home for, um, um, I don't know, I can't remember what it was, either hip replacement or knee replacement or something. Mm -hmm. And he had no family members uh, in town except a daughter that lived in Topeka. So he was in this rehab center and um, they did not have these documents in place. He, they forgot to strap him in bed. 
And in the middle of the night, he fell out of bed and hit his head against the corner of the wall by the bathroom. And nobody came to check on him for almost seven hours. And he had a room by himself. They found him in a pool of blood, unconscious. And they get him to an outside hospital quickly um, to find out that he has a brain bleed. So he's in there for an extraordinarily amount of time. Uh, the daughter contacts me and says, what do I do? And I just explained to her where she could checkmate certain things that the hospital was going to tell her or not tell her to get him back to the 50 yard line, which is exactly what we did. So the high level part of that advanced directive packet is one on one consulting with clients in real time as things unfold. So right. they understand how that document lives, because that document is alive. It, it, it has a lot of power in it. If you know how to use it. The other thing that I wanted individuals to realize is when you give an advanced directive packet to a hospital, one of the first questions that needs to be asked of that hospital is, are you going to honor this advanced directive? That's a valid question for a hospital. And they are required to tell you that if they say no, then you don't want that hospital. Now, if you make the mistake of going to that hospital without that question and you hand them the advanced directive and you find out in, in, in succeeding days that they're not going to honor that, you want the ability and the authority and the power to transfer that loved one out of that hospital. Right. And if, you're, if you don't know how to do that, then you are stuck in a cycle you do not want to be in. Does that make sense? Makes great sense. I mean, I've I've lived it to a certain extent, you know. Some of the things you were saying a few minutes ago about, you know, how a patient may be on medication and may appear to be a certain way or may not be in a state of mind in that moment to make certain decisions that made me think of a fairly recent experience that I had in my own scenario with the lady that I described earlier. I mean, what does a you know 75 year old female look like with a fairly raging UTI, a fairly high fever, dehydration? What does that person look like laying in a bed? You know, they look like they're dying. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not dying. And I don't know how many times I've had people tell me, oh my gosh, you know, I think that's exactly what happened to my mom or my dad, I think that's how they ended up getting us to agree to let them go, so to speak, let them mm -hmm. go. And, um, you know, uh, the contrast in my own scenario is that, okay, it went from a scenario that would appear to the average person is pretty bad to a couple months later, she's at my house sitting at my dining room table eating bacon and eggs on a Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. right? So that was on the coattails of a physician staring me in the face, telling me the Lord is calling her home. The hell he is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these are scenarios that are to a lot of people seem like outlier scenarios, but they're really everyday common situations. And they're becoming more prevalent. That's the problem. More people more don't. They, and i tell you that the, the older generation has, um, they've been brought up not to argue with physicians. They've been brought yep. up to respect their opinions um, and to follow their recommendations because these patients do believe that these doctors have their well being at heart. Years ago, I would have agreed with that. But seeing how the medical profession has changed over the last 20 years, I wouldn't buy that if it was handed to me on a platter. Um, you don't trust anybody and you don't trust anybody that says anything about any prognosis or diagnosis without verifiable evidence that you can make an informed consent about, not only for yourself, but for the benefit of the person who has entrusted you with the responsibility to be that individual's agent. You have got yeah. to know how to argue and to fight. And unfortunately, and I really do drive this point home, 
if the agent that you have that you have targeted uh, to be your agent is a family member or, you know, let's say a son or a daughter, and they couldn't find their way out of a paper bag by argumentation. That is the last person you want on there. If you've right. got somebody that does not know how to argue that, that can't concisely present their argument and their thought process and go toe to toe with the physician who is right. going to do circles around you, you don't need that person as an agent. You've got to do some really soul searching and digging and having conversations with these individuals so you know that what you've got is what you're expecting. Yeah, you want the family family Rottweiler. Yes, you do. Uh, who is willing and able to take on what can be uh, a real responsibility and not just for a day or two, but for even for years. Yes. You know, and on that note, um, with with the length and breadth of your experience going, you know, I know you've been involved in this work, as you said earlier, starting with the prison healthcare system. I mean, you've got 30 plus years of experience, and that is universally different than the average person walking around on the street, you know, driving to work, doing whatever it is they do all day. They don't really hardly ever think about these things. And I wanted to just quickly paint a picture from your perspective based on how you have seen the healthcare system that we all live with on the outside becoming more and more like the prison healthcare system. And I'm not suggesting that they're exactly the same. I'm not trying to say that, but the limitations, the dangers, uh, the situations that a prisoner who still has rights, they still have, they're still human beings who, if or if they are bleeding, need to be treated, right? If they have come down with a disease or a severe illness, have to be treated and, and quickly like anybody else. But oftentimes knowing your stories, they are not. And oftentimes they die as a result because family members don't know what to do or they come to you too late. How has the American standard healthcare system, as we like to call it, sort of denigrated over the years and, and become more like what you saw? I mean, do you have a couple of examples that you might be able to throw out there to give the average person an idea of just what they're dealing with? Well, one of the things, one of the main things that stand out with the inmates, um, Inmates, and I'm not talking about all inmates, I'm talking about inmates that are in there for a short period of time, although I've dealt with inmates that have life sentences without parole. So I've got to be careful on how I categorize this. But as a blanket statement, uh, inmates, for the most part, are not stupid and they are not ignorant when they're sick or something's extremely not right with their physical or mental state. They don't waste any time trying to get an appointment. And within the system, um, there are a lot of hoops they have to go through just to be seen by a physician. They're never seen by a physician first, ever. They are seen by a nurse practitioner. That's the first um nuance that I've seen in standardized healthcare out here. If you wanted to see a physician about XYZ, um, I, I'll use myself as an example. I, I fractured my foot not too long ago, and I knew what the or I knew who the orthopedic was that I wanted to see. Uh, I knew his reputation. I knew he was top notch in Kansas City. I wanted to see him. Well, they got me in all right, but I didn't see him. I saw the nurse practitioner. And granted, I understand why. It's kind of like the concept with paralegals and lawyers. If you've got a good paralegal, you know, she's X number of years short of being a lawyer, depending on, you know, what she's doing. Right. Um, the nurse practitioner was spot on, you know, professional, all of this stuff. So I realized it's, it's part of an economic thing. Same as the outside, same as the inside. They don't want it. They don't want you to see a doctor right away, not just because of the economic side, but because of the liability side. When you're going to a nurse practitioner or it's it's the first line uh, communicators that are or first line uh, treatment um, platform, it's cheaper. It's much cheaper. So 
that's the first nuance that that strikes me as being similar. The second is <laughs> this ability to get medical records. Um, before the electronic medical record system went into place, you had the right, anybody has the right to go after their own medical records by uh, requesting a formal request for your medical records. Detail request, you want this, that, and the other. What I found out over the years, the, the requests were too vague. Uh, if your requests aren't detailed enough, they have a lot of wiggle room not to give you certain information out of your medical record just because you don't know the terminology to use to get it. That has extrapolated out here into uh, free society. If I want if I want a certain um, blood panel that they ran on me and I just asked for a blood panel, uh, they'll send me a blood panel. It may not be the most recent one I had. It may be one I had a year ago. So it's these little nuances where they, 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 I'm not saying they premeditatedly do it. It could be just the system is this messed up because of a shortage of physicians and staff and whatever else you want to attribute it to. You have to know what exists in order to go after it for your benefit. And I tell people, you know, you're like when you become a patient, it's not, the doctors don't get to dictate to you. You're a customer. They are a provider. You're the one that's paying the bill. So if your questions aren't getting answered, like they're never answered in the prison system, they had to go through a lot of steps just to get an answer. Most oftentimes they never did. Ergo, that's why we use family members to go after it. We went after it in a different way. And one of those ways was to get these advanced directive packets in place. They can't ignore those. Um, and they never wanted the family members to know that, and they never wanted the inmates to know that. Because once those inmates put two and two together, then they saw what the game was in a much higher level. Same thing right. with individuals out here. Once you understand what they're doing to you on a big scale, you'll realize just how much information you are ignorant of that actually exists that can make your life and the lives of your loved ones that are left much easier. You know, the I's will be dotted. The T's will be crossed. There's no, there's no, don't pass, go, don't go this way. Don't go that way. This is what I want. Yep. Well, I think, I think anybody who's had their eyes open in the last several years knows what the possibilities can be when you look, when you think about the COVID years, and the things that happen to so many people in, in the hospital systems and in even outside of hospital systems and how people were treated. Um, I don't think anybody's ever going to really, truly forget that. But what I frankly am not surprised at is that we tend to fall back into complacency, right? When there isn't um, some pressing emergency and that's not the right time to be making uh, decisions and to be reacting with what is probably largely emotions. You know, if people have got to take, take time, they need to literally schedule time on their calendar with their spouse or their friend or their brother, whoever it is, that family Rottweiler, and talk these things out, ask questions. Are you willing to do this? If I were to do these documents, how would this work? Who would we go to as a second opinion? You know, like in my case, sometimes there could be a scenario where I may want to talk to a priest before I make a final decision for somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. I may want a second opinion from another doctor. I don't care how doctor one feels about that. It's not intended to be disrespectful, but if a doctor tells me something about someone else's life that I'm in charge of decision-making for, I very well may want a second opinion, and that's something that I can write in yes, as a can. customized aspect of this advanced directive. And in my case, I have. Yes. But I also want to say, because I say to people, you know, and, you know, the thing is, is that it's a it's a busy, distracting world. And all of a sudden, your 15 and a half year old teenager is now 18 and a half. Yeah, and this is where what? I was going to go next. No power over that eighteen-year-old. No. Oh, there have been. If you don't mind me interrupting you. No, please. Um, families, moms and dads, do not realize how important it is when their son or daughter turns eighteen. 
these documents ought to be an automatic. And I mean automatic like a driver's license. And I will give you an example. One 18 year old boy uh, was riding a motorcycle, ends up in a coma. Um, no advanced directive in place. It happened in Liberty. Um, no advanced directive in place. They, they, he's on a ventilator. He's out of it. All of these things. And he was on a ventilator for quite a while. Two weeks is quite a while in the hospital world when it comes to money. And um, when they, the when the social worker, I think I believe it was a social worker first because she was the uh, she was the extended arm of the medical ethics board of the hospital wanted to find out, kind of feel the family out of where they were um, with respect to treatment, you know, what, you know, how viable was it that he was going to, you know, snap out of this and become a great person again. And they were not anywhere close to doing anything. And the reality hit them when a physician came in to say, do you have or ask, do you have an advanced directive do you have advanced directive documents in place? And mm -hmm. well, it looks like we may have possibly lost our connection. Let me see what's going on here. He is an adult and right. he doesn't have he doesn't I'm gonna ask you. I'm going to ask you to back up about 10 seconds. I'm sorry, but it glitched out and froze up on me for a moment. So I just want okay. to see, I want to make sure everybody gets what you're saying. Okay. So, um, so he was I'm, in a coma. He totally was in a out. coma. The, the, nerd, the social worker comes in and says, blah, blah, blah. You know, what are, what are your thoughts? Do you think he's going to be able to, you know, recover? Yes, we do. Uh, we want all the stops pulled out. We want all the treatment that you can possibly give him. Well, what, what people don't realize, these hospitals are running on um, a spreadsheet. They are keeping tabs of how much money it's costing them to do X, Y, Z. Yes, they have insurance, but insurance is only going to pay so many dollars. Right. If you don't have an advanced directive in place on behalf of this young man like they didn't, they have no power, authority, or right to indicate, dictate, or ask a physician to do anything. They can't stop anything. If that hospital deems that two and a half weeks is entirely too long for their budget to have this kid on a ventilator, they can pull the plug. They don't need mom and dad's permission. This is one of the key things that I try to drive home to every parent. And you would be surprised, absolutely surprised, how much they don't pay attention to that. Oh, yeah. It just it blows my mind because as much as these kids are running around today, the, the you know, parental parental guidance and discipline it has fallen to such a level that these kids are doing stuff that, you know, normal 18 year olds way back when wouldn't even think of doing. And when they get into situations, whether it's a gunshot wound or a car accident or a motorcycle accident or um sports sports is a big deal um if you don't have these things in place you know you might as well be john q public because you're just not going to have any recourse yeah. especially when it, it is in, if it's infringing on that bottom line with the hospital clinic or a physician um or expertise you're going to get a rude awakening yeah yeah you're really good and you know if you have the advanced directive in place and you needed to move that individual from one hospital to another. We dealt with this in California. And you didn't have that in place. And they refused to let that individual go. Then you have to ask yourself, well, why is that hospital refusing to let my son go? What is right. it? You know, And it's usually something they've done or not done for that patient that has a very high probability of a good litigation. Right. And so... All of this stuff can be overcome and diverted when these documents are in place. It's a lot yeah. of heartache out of ignorance. Yeah, you know, I trying to put it into some kind of context, knowing that even, you know, it's true of me. I, there's no doubt that life is busy, life is distracting, and I can get forgetful or complacent about certain things. But 
I mean, really, I think all anybody has to do is just go back a couple of years in their life. And most of us probably in the last two or three years have known somebody close or far away who lost a loved one, possibly a child in a sudden accident. It's tragic. Everybody's, you know, feeling terrible about it. Um, and but, you know, the scenario that I'm thinking about is one where, you know, that individual had a chance to survive, um, you know, was alive for some period of time or, or frankly, could maybe just maybe they pulled through. That's great. That's another good scenario. But the key there is at that moment, the chances that that young person or that family member and the surrounding family members had documentation in place to deal with that is like negative six. I know. Yes, you're correct. And this is what I'm trying to drive home to people that I I have living experience, living proof for someone, not a family member, but a friend. And I really do believe, no, I don't believe it. I know it. I know that if I did not have these documentation, th these documents in place for her, I do believe that she would be dead now. And so I really credit the comprehensive nature of what you've put together as as being part and parcel to the fact that she's still alive and this is somebody who despite having you know mental and cognitive challenges is still a happy person is still someone who's joyful who enjoys to be around other people uh, and is still living a life i know some people like to focus on the so-called quality of life that could be an argument for another um conversation but that oftentimes overrules i literally had a nurse as part of this hospice the secular hospice group on the phone tell me you know she's not really doing anything she's just laying there mm -hmm. and that was supposed to somehow convince me well all right you know what starve her to death and when i asked well how long i mean i'm kind of playing a part there because i already know the answers to these things but i said well how long do you think it would take i mean do you expect her to pass away in the next day oh no i'll probably take about three weeks you're fired and so i was able to do that i was able to execute these decisions because of these documents now just turn that into your 18 19 20 year old son or daughter and imagine where your mind would be if something happened and you're powerless is well, it let me ask, let me just inter yeah let me interject this the other the other aspect of these advanced uh, directive packets is the um, paragraph we use for organ donation. Oh, I yeah. ask I ask individuals, you know, do you want to be an organ donor? That's the general vague question that I throw out there. Oh yes, I want to be an organ donor. What do you want? What organs do you want donated? Well. I want my eyes, you know, they'll start naming body parts and I'll say, well, um, do you, uh, do you want piece by piece or do you want a full body donation? Well, I didn't know you could do that. Well, if, if you want a full body donation, you've got to go through a lot of hoops in order to get that not only um, drafted, we have to submit that. That goes to another organization that's submitted. And I said, if you just say organ donation, are you also including tissue donation? And this is where this, I do this on purpose. I want them to think because if they say, oh, yes, I want to be an organ donor or a tissue donor or whatever it may be, then do you want to be a stem cell, you know, whatever donor? Do you want, you want to go down that road? So the, the organ donation language that we use is very, very specific. And a lot of them, after I explained the entire field there they end up saying i don't want to be an organ donor yeah and so the language i put in there is there's no question that they don't want to be an organ donor the other thing is a lot of people do you know some of them want to be tissue donors mm -hmm. um to to create new tissue for skin grafts or whatever you know burn victims and that type of thing and i understand that there's a way to do that, but then you really want to make it very specific and make it very narrow so they don't start going off to the side 
and grabbing something else. And I will give you an example with this. A mom lost her son. It was a motorcycle accident. Motorcycle accidents are quite prevalent. And she went into the autopsy room to identify her son post autopsy, which is unusual. And she looked at her son and was horrified because they had taken all the bones out of his arms and his legs. So when she's looking at him, if you've never, you know how you used to have, um, oh, well, a best, I don't, I don't even know what kind of example, Tootsie Rolls. Remember the little Tootsie Rolls that had the twisty things at both ends? Well, just imagine that there's a twisty tie at the bottom of where your foot would be. And there's a twisty tie where your, where your hand would be. And they had taken the bones out and she's horrified. Okay. I mean, horrified. Oh, she God. said, and, and she said, what is that? Well, he was, he was a, um, he was a, a organ donor. She goes, he was an organ donor, but he wasn't a bone donor. They're the difference. Yeah. And if you don't get specific, <laughs> they'll go off the rails and that's exactly what they'll do. And I never, I never got over that because she sent me pictures and I personally uh, have never seen anything like that in my life. So little nuances yeah. like that, this is what I'm trying to get these individuals uh, to understand. Because well, you know, I, I tell license. people on that subject, you know, especially, you know, younger people, I said, never underestimate the value of young vital organs. Oh, absolutely not. That should suffice. To tell people what they ought no, to be it thinking doesn't. and doing. Mm -mm. And you may recall some years back we were involved in a a case that we knew was headed in that direction. It was an unfortunate story when it was a young uh, teenager, um, sudden, kind of not exactly death, but death was imminent, you know, just dropped out of life mm -hmm. and it didn't have much time. And mom and dad didn't know what to do and we found out about it and we got them educated it was not an easy conversation to have and you know what do we do i said you don't have much time they'll be in the room soon like yes. they'll be there in an hour Bedside. right and they were mm -hmm. and and what they'll do is they will they'll share your grief but they'll ask you to think of the children you know, the famous thing that everybody likes to guilt us with. Think of all the others that could be helped. Mm -hmm. And um, in their case, I won't give details, but in their case, having that information, they were armed. We got documentation to them very quickly and not a moment too soon. And, you know, because who wants to think of what they're like in a state like that, a grieving state? I mean, you're out of your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, anything's possible. And I said, you know, you need to take into consideration what you really, truly want and what you believe. And it protected not only them, but more importantly, their daughter from being invaded before. And mm -hmm. I stress that word before she was actually even dead, because yeah. I think people don't have any idea. They don't realize that vital organs are, in fact, vital. To life. Well, they keep, yeah, they absolutely premeditatively keep them alive so they can not take it. You can't take a heart that isn't beating. Let's just put That's it that exactly way. right. And, and the, the other thing, are, um, yeah. what I, what I also realized most people, I found a statistic yesterday and it was less 30% or less individuals. No. I forget, what did I tell you earlier? 30% of, oh, the, population, of the population. Yeah. Less um, than 30. Less than 30% of the population actually have these advanced directive documents in place, which I find yes. horrifying. Absolutely. Of any, horrifying. of any type, let alone yes. yours. And that, let alone and that created. begs the question. And I thought, well, why is that? And then I came up with this idea. This answer for me was people do not like to face their own mortality. They don't oh, yeah. think anything's going to happen to them. Everything's going to be fine. And when the reality of it is, <laughs> that's not the way life works. 
It, it's just right. not the way that rolls. So I think if people would realize, you know, a lot of people will say, well, I'm dead. I don't care. Well, I know you don't yeah. care. and I understand the comment, but here's who does care are the people that are left behind. And your job is uh, your responsibility. Your job is to make that transition for your loved one as smooth as possible. You don't want them oh. having to engage in trauma and grief and, you know, badgering. You don't, you don't want to have to, you don't even want to lay that groundwork for them. No, I mean, it's, it's like I said, at the front end, it, it comes down to being a responsibility and, you know, lots of, lots of great parents out there, lots of, you know, mature adults who, who are doing the right thing as far as they can see in their scope and their view of things. But, but, you know, at the risk of offending, even the people who are watching, if you're not thinking about this as a responsibility, you are not being a parent, you are not being a mature, responsible adult, you are, you are acting on avoidance behavior. Uh -huh. And you know what, that may never bite you, it may never bite you in the butt, but it might. And there are many, many times when it does. And this is something obviously that oftentimes totally comes out of nowhere. Yes, Very is. little preparation, if any. And then you're looking back on a situation and think I could have prevented certain things from happening. And to be fair, it isn't it isn't to say that in some cases you can't get these documents created at the last minute, but you don't want to do this at the last minute. That's what I'm well, saying. Well, you, you can't yeah, you getting, getting them getting them created at the last minute takes time. And sometimes time you do not have. And right. that that becomes a problem. So I just it, it's such a simple thing to do to avoid such catastrophic outcomes. Yeah, it's so simple. Um, and and I just I, it, it just leaves me dumbfounded. People blow it off. They just blow well, it off. And I, and I kind of like to just put that in perspective and then maybe we can wrap this little session up. But um, to put it into perspective, you're talking about what may amount to be being a few hours as an individual right a few hours of your time to sit down and think these things through and converse with you beat up some ideas talk to the family members you're three to four hours i mean do you, do you think it would take much more than that no and and one of the things that i've always uh wanted to be able what wanted to be accessible to individuals was to give them the platform or the uh, invitation you can call with any question you have yeah you can call or email me with any question you have and some people take advantage of that some people may know of me or know of the institute and i, I haven't you know they haven't hired us as consultants but they'll call and they will call in a traumatic event a yeah. serious event miss russo what do i do now am i not going to help them i'm going to help them I'm going to walk them through exactly what they need to do. Um, I would be, I, I don't think I could really live with myself not to do that, but that's the kind of shock factor you don't want to have to go through. You just, you want all the planning done. You know, you may well, get, you may get a blip in the matrix somewhere because of something, but you're, you'll get back to the center line because you'll already know what you're supposed to do and what's available to do. Right. Well, I, I think it's very commendable, obviously, of you. And I know that that's the type of person you are. And I've seen you do that. But in the real world, that could quickly become a bottleneck. And you you have put a long amount of time and effort into creating something that is exceptional and comprehensive and vital. So there has to be a normal, everyday, transactional relationship there at the front end. And so I agree, there's always going to be somebody out there who has the need and I know you're gonna you're gonna pony up and make it happen for him and that's fantastic. But I don't want anybody to lose sight of the fact that this has a true financial value. And what I'll leave in the description of the video is just a simple uh email address to me so that we're not publishing your stuff in public right now. We can come to that. We can certainly do that in the future. But this way they can just reach out to me and say, can you can you give me Karen's contact information and I will give it to you. Um, and then we can decide in future, you know, how we want to handle these things, because like I said, we are going to make some additional videos. We are going to kind of drill down into some of the specifics and probably make them a little bit more, sh a little shorter and a little more pointed. 
And those will be more private videos um, that if somebody requests more information, then we can share two or three, you know, 10 minute type videos where they can learn some more specifics. Um, but as I say, up front, uh, the value here is worthy of protection and it's worthy of a uh, transaction and it's worthy of your time as you sit there and consider how to best plan out what you would want to see happen in any event, uh, you know, healthcare, medical, uh, medical decision-making, potential death uh, related decisions. It's not just all about somebody dying. It could be no. about somebody living yes, for a absolutely. very long period of time and how they're going to live. Yes. Uh, we don't know. We can't see into the future. And so, but, you know, we kind of do pretend in a sense that we can see into the future when we don't take action. It's really presumptuous. And I'm not saying that I'm not at fault. I have definitely been at fault um, for this type of um, inaction, I suppose you could say. But with that, um, I think it's a good place to to tie this one up and to say thank you for taking the time to explain these things and to help me to share this message. And then, like I say, if someone reaches out, you'll be the first to know. Um, and again, I'll put the email uh, in the description of the video. And that would uh, that'd be it. Karen Russo, thank you very much. And I appreciate thank you, your time. Thanks. All right. I we'll see you again soon. Time as well. Okay. Thanks a Got lot. It. Okay. Bye. Bye.